Craig's second lecture. Okay, thank you for coming back. Uh, I want to start out by kind of reminding you of some of the, the ideas and ex especially the examples that we talked about last time. Um, so we're especially interested in non-compact spaces because I'm, I'm interested in when we have a compact space to somehow capture the idea of what that space looks like at infinity. Um, the simplest example is if you take a half line, in other words, just the, uh, you know, cut the real line in half, just look at the positive half. Um, somehow the idea is fairly clear that that is an object that has one end to it, but if you have the entire line, you've got these two different directions that you can head off to infinity. Uh, that's a two-ended space. Um, you know, and we have actually formulated a definition now to, to make that precise. Um, but I want to have some other examples. So another example that we looked at last time was to uh, take the real line and then, actually, I think I left out one of the examples I had last time, which was, uh, let's include this in here. Uh, C, this will become D. D. The example I left out was one where we just took the real line and we attached a single half line to it. Uh, so this becomes C. F. I like to base things on lots of examples, so I just want to have these to refer back to. So we create a space with three ends, whatever that means. Again, we now know what that means by just taking a line and attaching a half line to it. Um, and then I created a couple of other spaces. Uh, one where in, instead of attaching just one half line, I attached a half line at every single integer. Um, I think I didn't have this one in last time, but you know it's pretty self-explanatory. Just take the half line and do the same thing. Um, and then there was sort of the, uh, um, I called this uh, T3, the this is the, the tree of, of index 3 at each vertex. And so, um, w with the definitions we have in hand, uh, oh, by the way, the reason I asked about graph theory, notice if I wanted to put vertices in here, all of these objects I've drawn here are just infinite trees. And so infinite trees play sort of a, a useful role here. Um, in some ways, they're the simplest models of what can happen. Uh, for ends of, of non-compact spaces. I wanted to show you that not every example is like that. You've probably spent a little time talking about manifolds in here. Here's a, my uh, effort at drawing a two-dimensional manifold, which is uh, possibly more complicated than the ones that you're accustomed to studying. But you can create a two-dimensional manifold with lots of ends as well. And so if um, in an introductory topology course, what you often do is you focus your attention on trying to classify all compact, or other, in other words, closed two manifolds. Um, things become quite a bit more complicated when you allow the compactness hypothesis to go away. And so here is an example of the sort of space you might have to deal with. You have a lot, you have a lot more two manifolds when you allow that to happen. And so what, we'll talk a little bit about how you might manage a space like that. But again, the, the, these, uh, these tree examples sort of serve as the, the, the simple models that, that we can focus on. Okay, so one, one of the definitions that was crucial last time, if you take any subset of your space X, you can count up the number of unbounded components. We just called that U of A, U for unbounded. Um, and then we defined the space to be K-ended if, and where K is possibly going to be infinity because you might you you have a supremum here that of a set that might not be bounded. Um, it's the supremum of U of n, where n is a neighborhood of infinity. Remember, neighborhood of infinity you get when you um, when you take a compact subset of your space and then you look at the complement of that. Okay, so. The neighborhood of infinity here I'm looking at is the complement of the pink stuff. And you see two unbounded components. So 
U of that neighborhood infinity is 2, and you realize in this example that no matter how you draw the neighborhood of infinity, um, as long as it has at least one point in it, uh, you always have two unbounded components. Now you might have a compact set that looks like that, and you might have some bounded components, but we're, we just sort of throw those away. We're not too interested in those. So with this definition, we can make precise the notion that uh, this space is one-ended. Take any compact set. Maybe it doesn't contain that point, but that component is bounded. You've got the one unbounded component, and that persists forever. Um, Three-ended, not too hard to convince yourself of that. It might take a while. First, I only have two unbounded components, but as my compact set gets bigger eventually, it's got to contain this point. And then I'm going to have three unbounded components, and I'm never going to get any more than that. These examples are a little bit interesting. You, you take compact sets, The one I drew, it looks like we have one, two, three, four unbounded components. Um, you're always going to have finitely many unbounded components, but the bigger your compact set is, the more you pick up. So this uh, supremum ends up being infinity here. So not surprisingly, this is an infinite-ended space. This one's also infinite-ended, as is that one. And so one of the things I want to try to do first today is to say, well, can we refine what we're doing here in order to distinguish between infinite-ended spaces? Uh, somehow, um, it seems like <laughs> you know, this space, in some sense, has more ends than this. We've, you know, we've sort of doubled it. Of course, if you were at my talk last night, that's kind of meaningless. When you double infinite things, that doesn't always change anything. Um, certainly when you double it, well, I, I guess I, what I have to do is I, I've sort of avoided the issue of what is the end of a space. I, I've said it's k-ended if it has this property, but we've never really said what we mean by an end of a space, and, and I want to take care of that. Um, and I'd like to develop enough technology to tell, for example, the three infinite-ended spaces apart. So let, let's sort of get started on, on doing that. Um, so the goal is to create a theory that allows us to distinguish between Examples. Uh, let's just give them by their, their names over here, D, E, and F. Okay, so here is a key definition. It's a little bit abstract, um, but I, I think with the pictures, uh, it, it makes pretty good sense uh, physically. So. Well, let me put a note here before I get started. This is sort of a note that allows us to simplify things. You might find it a little annoying when I choose a compact set and I say, well, some of the components are bounded and some of them are unbounded. One trick you can use is if your compact set happens to have some complementary components that are bounded, you can just take those and toss them in to the compact set. You could have you know, if, if you're in the plane, your, your compact set could look like this. It could be like a disk, but with lots of holes in it. So there actually could be infinitely many bounded components. Nonetheless, if you toss them all in with your, we'll call that set C, if you toss them all in with C, the object will still be compact. So when you're creating compact sets, you can always arrange that the only component, by the way, that's not, not a trivial fact to prove, and it does depend on some of the special properties. Remember I said that our spaces X are always um, locally compact, locally path connected. Uh, properties like that are, are useful for that. But let, let me state the note that uh, 
for any. Well, let, let's let's say it's sort of informally. If if we add to a compact set C subset of X all bounded components of the complement, the result is compact. Moreover, now we're in a situation where all of the complementary components are unbounded, so you don't have any junk out there like this that's sort of clouding up the uh, your, your idea of, of looking for uh, ends of a space. So the result is compact, uh, and all of its complementary components. Okay. And so I'm going to refer to a compact set with that property as being efficient. So call I just want some notation here. So when, when you add to C all of those bounded components, let's just call that new compact set C prime. So call such a compact set C prime subset of X efficient. So it's a way of coming in and cleaning up your, your compact set so that uh, nicer things happen. Okay, so now I want to describe how we're going to make precise this notion of ends of a space. And so we're going to do this. So let x be our space. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to express X as this monotone union of compact sets. Okay, so if you did the homework, you know that with these conditions we have on, uh, this, is, this is doable. So So that's a, that's a lot of words, but it's all I'm saying is you take your space X and then you choose a compact set C1 and if it happened to have some holes in it so that you had some bounded components, go ahead and fill those in. When I say it's an efficient exhaustion, I mean each of those compact sets is efficient. Okay. And then you take a bigger set C2 and C3 and so on. When, when, when they fill up the space, you say that they together they exhaust the entire space. And so that's what I mean by a compact exhaust. Okay, of course I've drawn a really simple example where each of the CIs I drew only had one complementary component, but that's not really what I'm interested in. I'm interested in situations like this, or, or the picture I erased there, where when you do this, you have a lot of complementary components of a compact set. And so I have a definition now to open it for you. Okay. Um, for 
each I wet. Well, we're really interested in neighborhoods of infinity, right? So we let ni be equal to x minus ci. That's a neighborhood of infinity. And now, presumably, that neighborhood of infinity has multiple components to it. So, notation here gets a little bit ugly, but again, I think the ideas are pretty simple. Um, remember, Ni is just, again, this, this uh, depends on the niceness of the space, but in the cases we're at, and there will only be finitely many components here. And so the notation I want to use is n sub i um, with a superscript j. Okay. And what these are, these are the collections of components of n i. So when you see a superscript on there, that means it's not the entire space n i, it's just one of the components of n i. So let this be set of components. Of N. Okay, and now I can actually give a physical interpretation of what I mean by an end of a space. So we'll use some not very surprising notation. The set of the ends of X is a collection of sequences. Okay? And the first entry in your sequence is just going to tell you, should have had that picture there, you have your space C1 and it's got finitely many complementary components. The first entry, just you choose one of the components of the first neighborhood of infinity. So you'll choose you'll look in the neighborhood N1, and you'll figure out which component of N1 it's in, and you'll give it that number. So uh, I'm going to call that J1 here. Yes? Um, could you explain more time how we know that it has finitely many? Uh, that, that's actually a fairly complex exercise. <laughs> it, it's, it's not true in general spaces, because I could create a space like this, where you have an entire sequence of arcs. Okay, and there's no reason you can't apply the theory to something like this, but uh, one of my hypotheses was that the spaces are locally path connected and locally compact. And with a fair amount of hard work, <laughs> you can prove that in that situation you will only have finitely many complementary components. Okay. But you're, you're absolutely correct in being skeptical because without that, Obviously, you take this compact set, and, and you do have infinitely many unbounded points. Okay. But for, for this definition, actually, you should feel free to, um, to consider cases where, where that happens also. That, that won't make this definition invalid. I'm just trying to make things a little simpler for us. Okay. Okay, so now you know what I'm going to do. The, the second entry in your sequence is going to be one of the components of the second neighborhood. Okay, but the only way this gets to be part of a sequence is if this component is contained in this component. Okay, so I'm going to do this then forever. I just, every time I go to a smaller neighborhood of infinity, I pick one component but the component I pick has to be contained in the previous component I chose. Okay, so N3 and then J3 and so on. Do that forever. And so this is uh, such that N, I, J, is that okay? Yeah, I guess the J, I is here. Um, has to contain n i plus 1, j i plus 1. And this is for all i. Okay. 
So, so it's worth thinking about one of these examples for that, this. Okay, so if you, in some ways this is the most complicated, but it's also the best example for thinking about this. If you choose a compact set that looks just like this for your C1, now you're choosing one, well, let's see, if I, if I contain this point, I've got one, two, actually, I, let's, let's not go quite that far. I don't want too many components to get started, so let's suppose the first compact set looked like that. So I have the three complementary components. You pick one of them, and now you choose a bigger compact set. So maybe it goes out this far. And you've got one, two, three, four, five, six components. But uh, if you've already chosen, say, this component, now you have to choose one of the components contained inside of it. So you, you're allowed to form as many sequences as you can that way. And each of those sequences sort of pushes you out in a certain direction towards infinity, right? Because each of these ni, each of these components you choose is a little further out in the space, and it's a little bit finer. And so um, this is what we are going to call the set of ends of the space. You know, if infinity is an elusive thing. You don't, you don't really grab the end of the space. You define it as this abstract concept as one of these sequences. Okay, so let's see. Um, so here's an exercise. And uh, so somehow earlier we defined what it meant to be k-ended without, without saying what an end was at all. This definition still made sense. But now you'd like to make sure that these definitions agree. The exercise is to show that if you have a k-ended space, then it has k ends. <laughs> and that's not a tautology. That's, there is actually something you're proving there. So, um, so exercise show that if x is k n, then well, then this, I'm going to use absolute values to stand for the cardinality of the set. And the, set, the cardinality of the set of n's of x is indeed equal to k. <coughs> okay. But, well. Can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. So, are we equating, like, if, you're, if your sequence goes out to the same end at like different speeds, do we have uh -huh. a way to like make uh -huh. those ends equal? Okay, well actually you, you've hit upon a, a real a good issue here. Notice the way I've given you the definition is you choose your compact exhaustion first and then you mm -hmm. use it. So there really are no different speeds because I tell you to choose one component in the complement of C1, one component in the complement of C2, one component in the complement of C3. I think the real, the real issue behind your question is, what if somebody else chooses a different exhaustion? Yeah. Are they going to get the same result? Because they, uh, they could use the same compact sets but throw away every other one. Mm -hmm. And then, then the, the idea of the speed, they're going to infinity faster, right? Yeah. So, yeah, that's another uh, exercise. Um, okay. If I... <laughs> If I had three weeks instead of one week, mm -hmm. I would probably be presenting more of these things instead of putting them all on your shoulders. But, um, but yeah, that, that's, that's a very good thing to think about. Um, what you have to do is, um, to compare the different ends, you would like to know that if you have somebody else has a different end that they produced using different compact sets, that eventually the entries in their sequence are contained in one of the entries in your sequence, and mm -hmm. vice versa. And then you declare those ends to actually be equivalent. Yeah. So there, there is a more general way to do this without starting with an exhaustion, but it becomes 
to my mind, really abstract. And I, I feel like it's a little more concrete to just allow yourself to pick one exhaustion and then come back later and convince yourself that it didn't really matter which one you chose. Okay. Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah. Um, is, the, is that fact that the, the ends are nested, is that like an extra thing that we're adding on, or does that necessarily come from the fact that it's an exhaustion? Yeah. It, to me, like the complements wouldn't... Yeah, yeah, no, no, you're, you're right. There are lots of sequences where, where this would not hold, okay. but, we, but we throw those away. The set of ends are the sequences that have this property. Right. Okay, so let's see. I had another... Oh, and well, the other part of the exercise, but I'd like to talk about this together. Uh, but since I'm not going to write down a formal proof, I'll, I'll leave... Uh, so this was A. B is going to be to show that this actually helps us to solve some of the problems we've got here. Um, and that would be to show bad examples uh, D and E. Let's say it this way. Show that four examples D and E. You're assuming the definition from yesterday okay. bef before, yeah, before we actually defined what ends are. So, so yeah, really that's what this is about, is making sure that the definition from the first day, which was convenient because we didn't need quite so much uh, technical machinery for that. Um, so, so if this was all you were interested in is finite ended spaces, for example, you probably wouldn't bother with all this. But then you realize, okay, if I... If I'm going to go into the weeds and deal with these guys, I, I need to develop it further. But we'd like to make sure that what we do today doesn't contradict what we did yesterday. Okay, so let, let's think about these examples. Um, convincing yourself that uh, these spaces have countably many ends, and that one has uncountably many, probably isn't going to be that hard for you, right? Because notice... So, so first of all, allow yourself this much. Allow yourself to pick whichever exhaustion you want. I, I, I've got some comments coming up that say that, you know, that doesn't matter. But if you choose, especially those of you who have done graph theory, you kind of know how to choose subgraphs so that the, you know, uh, first maybe choose just a, a vertex so you've got three complementary components. And then choose the, the subtree of, of all uh, vertices and edges di distance one from this vertex, and then every one of those components splits into two. And then every one of those components splits into two. And you can just see what, what's happening there in terms of creating an uncountable set, right? If, if you have two choices and you get to make it countably many times, well, the Cantor diagonalization type argument will allow you to prove that's uncountable. Uh, and, and then, well, over here, you want to convince yourself that that's not happening. What happens over here is, for a lot of these ends, once you have, uh, once you sort of split them off, there are no choices involved whatsoever. You know, one, I choose a bigger compact set, but there's only going to be one component that's contained in this one. And you, you'll, you'll be able to, if, if you want to write down a formal proof of that exercise, you'll be able to do it. It's, it's certainly not, you know, as I said, Given three weeks instead of one, we we probably write down some of the, the arguments here. Okay, so now, uh, in my notes, I say, okay, technically now, the way I've defined ends depends on the exhaustion, so maybe I need to own up to that uh, in writing instead of just verbally. So I'll remark, technically...
ends of x, the way I've defined it anyway. Again, there are, there are more abstract definitions that get around this, but it depends on our choice. Of that exhaustion by compact set CI. Okay, and uh, but with some effort, we can show. There is a, a standard fact here, which, uh, uh, do I really want to erase these guys? I don't think I want to erase all of them. Let's, let's see if I can preserve some of this stuff. Okay, so the lemma is, well, the lemma really just says that you can do it if you really want to. So if, if ci and di are both exhaustions, and if you want, by, by the way, what happens if you accidentally left some bounded components in there? Um, they, they would never appear in one of these sequences, right? Because eventually the bounded components are going to be swallowed up by one of your compact sets, and it's going to be like a dead end. You're, you're, you're not going to be able to create a sequence. So it doesn't really hurt to leave those in. It's just a little cleaner if you, if you don't have those. But um, you know, if, if you want the exhaustions to be efficient, you know how to make it happen. But you don't have to. some notation that I think explains itself for you. I'm going to say the ends of x that you get by using the exhaustion ci. And then there are the ends of x that you would get if, if uh, you happen to have chosen a different exhaustion. And there's a way of, of forming a bijection between those two. Okay, and I sort of gave you the idea how to do it. You look at this sequence, and eventually one of those components is going to be contained in, in one of these guys. And you start deciding, if you, if you start with a sequence, you're going to be able to choose exactly one of these guys, which is consistent with it. And, and you can reverse that process and make it a bijection. So. Definitely not beyond what we could do here if, if we had more time to do it. Okay, so here is an easy theorem now. And that is that uh, the cardinality of n's of x is a topological invariant. Okay. Um, in other words, if two spaces are homeomorphic, the, the cardinality of the set of n's is going to be the same for both. And the proof of that is really simply that if uh, you have a homeomorphism, and you have an exhaustion of your set x, so ci 
is a compact exhaustion. then the images of each of those CIs is going to be a compact subset of Y. So that's going to be a compact exhaustion. F is going to take the complement of CI to the complement of F of CI. And because images of connected spaces are connected, it's also going to take the components of CI, of the complement of CI, to the components of the complement of F of CI. And that's really all there is to it. So I can say more if you want me to, but uh, that, that, that sort of is the whole story, I think. Should, should I write down what I said, or should I move on from there? Okay, we'll, we'll go ahead and move on. Again, uh, the details, I'm, I'm not really hiding anything hard from you. I'm just trying to, to keep pushing us forward. So, let me, let me uh, acknowledge that there's more to it by saying it said. But that, that's really all there is that you need to worry about. Okay, well, unfortunately, that leaves us with something a little bit unsatisfying, and that is we've got two spaces still, which each have countably many ends in this very precise sense, but they look quite a bit different. We haven't actually been able to um, we haven't been able to distinguish between these guys, and so it turns out that there is a nice method for doing that. Uh, which involves something more, um, more sophisticated than just counting how many ends there are. It involves actually using topology. Okay, and so what we're going to do is, um, is we're going to put a topology on the set of the ends of X. And let's, let's say a little bit more about that. Let me use the the yellow here. And should finish, I should reclaim these pictures I've got here. Now, of course, you, you need to do some work to convince yourself that this abstract definition of ends is really capturing what's happening here. But if you have done all the exercises, you know that this first space up here, whoops, that was supposed to be the half line, wasn't it? That has one end. And what we're going to do is we're going we're to glue a point. For each end, we're going to think of that end as a, an actual point, And we're going to glue it onto the space. In this situation, we're going to glue one point over here and another point over here. In this space, we, would got, we have three ends, and we'll actually glue a point onto this end, a point onto this end, and a point onto this end. Okay. Does this look familiar at all, doing anything like this? Is this the local complexification? Yeah, this, this is going to be, this is, so, so there is a way to make any reasonably nice non-compact space compact by adding a single point at infinity, and then you define a topology on it so that your original space is really just a subspace um, of this compact object. This is going to be a more sophisticated version. Instead of gluing just one point on, we're going to glue one point for every end. And if we do it carefully, we can do it so that the object we end up with is compact. It's a little bit... <laughs> It's a little bit hard to prove. I'll, I'll, I'll sort of say why it's the case and maybe wave my hands a little bit. But then once we have done that, that that's going to be really useful to us because if, now if we do it here, what we're going to see is that, well, we have an end here also. 
Okay. But when we pull it, to make this compact, what's going to happen is this sequence of points is going to converge to that point, and this sequence of points is going to converge to this point. So in this endpoint compactification, there are going to be two special points, which are limit points of the rest of the points in the space. Whereas in this space, there's only going to be one special point. You know, you're, you're going to put a point here, a point here, a point here. And somehow, when we topologize this, these guys are going to converge to this point. But if you compare the two subspaces, there will be something different about the topology of the ends here. They're both countable sets, but one countable set has just one limit point, and the other countable set has two. Up here, any, any guesses? If, once we put, you know, I can't really even draw these, but once we put an N, a point out there for every N, any guess what the space of N's is going to be? S1, the circle? Uh, not quite, not quite. It's, it's not going to uh, have quite that many points. It's a sub subspace of S1. Oh, the, the torsion, like the rational points. Uh, not, not those either. <laughs> uh, any other guesses? It's going to be a Cantor set. <laughs> okay? You know, you can kind of see it now, right? Because what do you do with the Cantor set? You take an interval. Well, normally we split the interval into two pieces, but it's still a Cantor set if you split it into three pieces. And then, well, so we split it first into three, and then after that we split each of those into two. And so... Uh, so that's kind of a cool uh, place where the, can the canter set rears its head in all these interesting places. And this is one of the really interesting places, I think, where that happens. So, okay. So what I would like to do is show you how to put a topology on... So, so what, what do we have? We have x. Here's our goal. Is to create a space... which is x together with, and I'm, I'm going to use the notation I used last night, I'm going to use this square union for disjoint union, because you've got the set x, and then you've got this collection, this very abstract collection called the ends of x. But you want to meld them into a single space. Now, so take this and topologize it. Okay, um, we'll call the results x bar. It's kind of like taking a closure. It's, um, so I, th I think the notation is suggestive. It's x together with the endpoints added on. And it will be known as the endpoint compactification. And I, I would I would like to compare this since I, I know you've thought about this recently. Um, it is comparable to, now I don't know if you called it this, but most people call it the one-point compactification. Okay, and then again, I'm not sure what notation you use. When I talk about the one-point compactification, I often refer to it as x star. I take x and I add one point to it. Sometimes we just call that point infinity because now you just have to think of infinity as being an abstract one point. <laughs> the name infinity seems appropriate there because in that case you're thinking of everything that lives 
out near infinity as being, you know, just one direction. What we're doing here is we're just refining that and we're sort of uh, fracturing infinity to these different directions. Okay. But what you recall, you know, you, you may not have had the terminology we had, but what you did is, well, let, let, me, let me go ahead and, oh, whoa, okay. sorry about that. You have a disjoint union there? Yeah. Uh, somewhere. But it, aren't the ends of X uh, neighborhoods of infinity of X, which are subsets of X? Well, they're really these sequences, so okay. they're... They're like you, the limits of, of the subsets of X. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're, they're sort of like these abstract objects. And, and that's actually why I was sort of careful to denote the disjoint union, because even though they're created by using subsets of x, we want to think of these as additional points we're adding on. So, um, so yeah, they, they, these are sort of abstractly created objects. Okay, so I think I want to leave that definition up. And I just wanted to remind you that the way you put a topology on this, uh, let's say T star is the topology here, what you did is you just took the, initial, the regular topology on X, in other words, all the open subsets of X still get to be open subsets of X star. But then what you did, and again, maybe with different uh, notation, you took the neighborhoods of infinity and you added to them this one point, and you said that gets to be an open set also. I guess I should say the open neighborhoods of infinity. So you also took all the sets of the form x minus c union that one point at infinity, provided c was a compact set. So for all C, compact subset of X. Okay, so now you're in general topology mode, and you have to do things like prove this really is a topology, and it really is compact. But th th those are nice, simple exercises to do. And what I want to do is a refined version of this. So for the endpoint compactification, oh, but I, I guess I want to say one thing. One nice thing about T star or this X star, it's pretty easy to prove that when this works out, that you have a compact set, because if you take an open cover of this thing, one of those points. One of those elements your open cover has to contain infinity, so it has to be one of these guys. And then the, the remainder is then compact, so obviously you can cover up the rest of what's left with finitely many sets. Um, in this refined version, it's, that's going to be a, a, tougher, <laughs> a tougher situation to see that what you really have is, is compact. Okay, but uh, let, let me go ahead and tell you what it is. Um, So let's see. Uh, maybe I, I, you know what, I lied to you. I, I called this guy X bar, and in my notes I, I want to stick with, I called it X hat instead. So let's, let's go with X hat here. So we define, well, what, what do I want to tell you? Um, so, so X hat is equal to x together with the ends of x. And I need to tell you what the open subsets are. And so, no surprise, I'm going to use t hat to stand for the topology on x hat. And first of all, 
all of the old open sets, so T just stands for the original topology on X. And then I have to have the analogs of the open neighborhoods of the points at infinity. So now I have lots of points at infinity, and I don't want to just clump them all into the same open sets all the time, or I, I really haven't done anything new. And so what I need to do is something like this. Um, say this informally uh, since we're, we're just about out of time here and I, I, don't, I don't want this to just be a, an exercise in notation together with sets of form to simplify the notation a little bit. The, the trouble is a, a single point at infinity has this horrible notation and so I want to refer to one of those sequences is just epsilon. Epsilon kind of stands for n. So epsilon equals n1 j1, n2 j2, n3 j3. And so I wanted to find the neighborhood of this point. And so what I will do is I'll just go into this sequence and I'll take all the, if, if I want a small neighborhood, I go far in the sequence. I take one of these components of infinity and I, and I take all those points and those get to be in the neighborhood of epsilon. But there are going to be some other elements of the n's. These aren't all going to be isolated. There are going to be a lot of other ends that had that same n epsilon in this slot, but then they differed when I went further out in the sequence, and they are considered to be in the same neighborhood. So well, let me go back to this picture. Uh, if I want a neighborhood of this n right here, what I should do is I should, if I want a small neighborhood, I should choose a really big compact set and then choose one of the complementary components. So let's assume my really big compact set was this stuff. Okay. So now right away I know that I'm in this component. So all the points in this component get to be in the neighborhood of this guy. But also all of the points, all of the other ends which have this component as their, you know, if this is say your uh, kth term in that sequence, if you have the same kth term, you get to be in there too. So this point is considered to be nearby to that point because its end also is defined commonly with that term. Notice what that means is that this point, no matter how small the neighborhood is, there are going to be other ends in that neighborhood, and that's why um, none of the points here are isolated. Whereas here, you know, here once you get this neighborhood. Well, let's go with this guy. This point is going to have a neighborhood where it's the only end contained in it. And so that's how these end spaces end up looking different, is the topology they get. So um, I feel like I've maybe used all my time up here. So uh, I want to just finish writing down this definition, perhaps. Um, So, so for, if, if you pick your n, you, you add the open sets that contain n, uh, n sub k, j sub k union all elements 
of n's of x, which, which have that in the, as their kth coordinate. So that's a little sloppy. I'll come back and tidy this up at the beginning of next time. But I think that at least gives you the big picture of what we're doing. And uh, well, a nice challenge is to convince yourself that this object we have is compact. <laughs> and I'll, I'll warn you that uh, um, it's not so easy. It's, uh, it's, it's on a different level of proving the one point compact case is compact. But it's still a useful thing to think about. All right. Okay. Finished. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. Could you just explain how the 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 big graph f yeah. has uncountably many ends again? Okay. Sure. Um, so let's. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to first fill this thing up with, I'm, I'm going to allow myself to choose the exhaustion I want, and I, we've talked about why that's okay. So the first compact set I'm going to choose is going to just be a one-point set. So I'm thinking about all the different sequences that I can create, uh, which satisfy this definition here, that the components are contained in the previous entry. Right. So I have to pick one of these three components for starters. So I have, I have three choices here. Okay, I'm either going to pick this component, this component, or this component. Now, the next compact set, I want to go out just one unit in the, in the graph. And now notice, for each of those three components, I have two choices here. So I had three choices here. and now once one of the, the, so I actually have six choices for the second slot, but really I only have two choices, right? Because once I choose this guy, I now have two choices uh, here. Okay? But now if, if, I, if I just keep going out one unit, every time I move, so these guys, but this, of course, keeps going. When I move to the next component, again, I have two choices. So I had three choices and then infinitely many two choices. And so the set of all sequences that satisfy the definition uh, has the same cardinality as the set uh, Well, this is a little annoying that I had one extra choice here because I can't write down some. But, but I think you probably know that the infinite product of two point sets, A, B, a countable infinite product of two point sets is uncountable. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's the same Cantor diagonalization. If you write down all the sequences of A's and B's and you think you've listed them all, you can diagonalize and you can find one that you miss. Mm -hmm. and so, uh, for that reason, this set is uncountable, which means there are uncountably many uh, different n sets. Cool. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, right. well, I guess we have lunch, so if you have informal questions, uh, we can do those over lunch. Anything Thank you. else, Jack? Nope. Okay. <laughs>